we should all be as passionate as Tony Romo is about the NFL. I was, and he was right. That was that, that that was the that was the gutsiest call I've seen all year, and maybe you've seen for for a long, long time. Uh, oh boy, I guess we feel a little bit opposite. Tennessee feels a little bit opposite uh, uh, than we do about Tony Romo uh, when it comes to uh, to their. I guess no longer head football coach. And we bring on Connor O'Gara, our friend from Saturday down south, to uh, talk about this. Connor, we did not, we didn't know we'd be talking about uh, a, a, a head coaching change and possibly an athletic director change at the University of Tennessee. When the show started, we had some other things to talk about, but we get to break news today. What's your reaction? My goodness. I mean, you kind of thought that this was coming, and I've said, multiple times in the last couple weeks. It doesn't seem like Jeremy Pruitt will be there for Tennessee come SEC media day time. But to see this happen, you know, Monday, right when we're kind of, you know, getting into the groove of the week and everything, um, it, it certainly hit me as not necessarily a shock, but as a wow type of moment to see not just that Jeremy Pruitt is out, but that Phil Fulmer is stepping down and reportedly retiring as athletic director, and that's something that I, I think for those who are wondering, well, you know, Phil Fulmer's the guy who gave Jeremy Pruitt the extension four months ago, the now infamous extension, would he be able to fire Jeremy Pruitt? And I guess we sort of got our answer to that, even though his retiring is reportedly not a direct result of the internal investigation that led to Jeremy Pruitt getting fired with cause. So a lot to still sort out, but just a typical Monday in the SEC, I guess. It felt like Pruitt was put on notice when they hired Kevin Steele as the defensive coordinator. And does it, does it make too much sense to just go, go with Steele, the guy that that was the runner up in the in the in uh, in their decision to hire the last head coach anyway? One would think, but here's the here's the weird thing because you know I've been saying for a while he freeze to the SEC seems obvious, and I know he loves that job at Tennessee. That's that's the the job that he's been linked to more so than any other, you know, during these past few months that he's been a, a, a very popular coaching candidate because of his roots, you know, in the volunteer state. But we're talking about somebody who had recruiting violations as well. It wasn't just the escort service stuff that led to his, his demise. It was the recruiting violations that gave Ole Miss a multi-year bowl ban. And now if Tennessee just fired a head coach for recruiting violations, then how do you go and turn around and hire someone who had major recruiting violations in this conference? It might not be as easy as that. So that's the thing that I just, you know, I think that in Tennessee, if Tennessee, you know, has shown us anything, it's that it's not going to have a traditional head coaching search. Um, it'll probably take to Twitter, poll its fans, maybe stage a riot. I don't know. This thing isn't going to end in normal fashion because it never does at Tennessee. But I think the Hugh Freeze thing, while we kind of assumed that that was going to be the obvious fit, it, it's it's a little bit more complicated now that the recruiting violations are part of it. Yeah, it sounds like major uh, recruiting violations. So as far as Pruitt's concerned, I mean, this this makes him uh, radioactive, man. I mean, talk about somebody that was – Heading upwards as an as an Alabama coordinator and a national champion, and and gets a chance at Tennessee, and it looked like he might have righted the ship at the end of 2019. But gosh Almighty, they could not have imagined how much this would have blown up in the last year. I'm I'm pretty amazed. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about Jeremy Pruitt as the most obvious replacement for Nick Saban at Alabama, and we were talking about this win streak, on this active win streak in the country. And ever since then, it's just gone downhill in a hurry. You know, maybe a year like this in the SEC where you would only conference games sort of magnify these issues. But Tennessee was a program that for the last three months just looked like it totally fell apart. And their, their margin of defeat in the second half, uh, in the second half of, of games, I think once this losing streak started for them, was something astronomical. Like they were at one point getting outscored. I think it was like 116 to 14 in the second half of games. And you're thinking to yourself, how in the world can a coaching staff be, you know, so good for for a long period of time, then all of a sudden look that bad, making adjustments? In Tennessee, when you hear more and more about some of these transfers and 
Ty Sandler's going and DeAndre Johnson's going and these key players for this team, it just kind of led you to believe that something was going to happen. Tennessee was going to find something when it did this internal investigation. Sure enough, that's what happened. Connor O'Gara joining us from Saturday Down South here on Halftime. We talked about Hugh Freeze possibly being in this job, but Connor, I think the obvious candidate here is going to be Kevin Steele because I, we were talking prior to you jumping on here with us. I don't think you make this move and you don't make Kevin Steele the permanent head coach, assuming Hugh Freeze isn't interested or anything like that. But aside from those two names, who could go? Who could Tennessee possibly go after right now? Because the big time hires are gone. Urban Myers off the board. He's to the NFL. All those big names are gone. So is it Kevin Steele, Hugh Freeze, and if not them, who else could it be? Well, there are two big names who are currently unemployed right now. Um, certain Gus Malzahn, certain Tom Herman. Now, I don't know that Tennessee would swing for the fences there. And to be honest with you, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but I'm not even sure if Tom Herman or Gus Malzahn would all of a sudden sign up for that job, knowing oh. that you could be facing sanctions. Mm-hmm. You, you could be, if, if these you know findings are going to lead to a bowl ban or something like that, that's something you have to consider. The Kevin Steele option makes the most sense at this current juncture when if you are going to have a couple of years where it's going to be rough and recruiting is going to take a hit and you can't play in the postseason or, or there's there's stuff like that that you're working with, it could make more sense to just be like, all right, let's just kind of ride this out for two years. We'll pay him $3 million bucks a year. He's probably going to be at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to average salary among SEC head coaches. You just kind of hope that somebody with Kevin Steele's experience can hold things together and not make things worse. Uh, his experience as a head coach is obviously limited given what he did at Baylor about 20 years ago, but this is still a job that I think right now has so many moving pieces where you don't even know who's going to be handling the hiring that it's so early probably to try and figure out what this is going to look like that the path of least resistance, everything suggests Kevin Steele will be the guy, but it's Tennessee. Crazier things have happened. It's funny we bring up bring this up, and obviously he's not getting a buyout. Jeremy Pruitt is, but I really enjoyed reading your article yesterday about all the buyout money that Nick Saban at Alabama has caused to all these other SEC schools, and almost a hundred and sixty nine million dollars. Connor, that's insane, and I've really enjoyed this article. And this had to have been eye opening just for the amount of coaches that the SEC has turned over and went through just for teams to try to get a shot and beat Alabama. Yeah, and all of this has sort of coincided with Alabama's rise. And it was something that took a, a long time to be able to, to kind of, I think I, I mean, I probably spent like eight hours researching all these buyouts and stuff, but it's all out there. And it's kind of crazy when you break down some of the figures, and especially at a place like Arkansas, you know, who yeah, had the, the lawsuit with, with Brett Bielema, the well documented lawsuit, and, and all these things that, you know, we, we kind of just assume now, but there wasn't always a time in which these buyouts were at, at these rates. But when you look at it in the SEC and you see that there are places, you know, like South Carolina that are, that are now shelling out eight-figure buyouts for, for coaches, and the fact that all this has coincided while Alabama has done something that we've never really seen before in college football it just kind of makes you realize that even during a pandemic, nothing can really get in the way of the SEC being the SEC. And it has been at the forefront of this buyout craze. And it's it's kind of startling to think about the direction it's heading. And, and to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if it continues to get worse. Because if there was ever a year in which it was going to kind of go away and maybe teams weren't going to want to pay these, these mass buyouts, it was this year. And that didn't happen at all. And simply the two biggest buyouts in SEC football history with Gus Malzahn and Will Muschamp. So, yeah, it was, it was startling to see some of these figures and the fact that that there are so many SEC schools willing to pay their coaches to go away. I mean, that that just that, that blows me away, and that's something that we couldn't have predicted even back in 2006 or 2007. Well, that's what's insane to me, Connor. So it's like if you take out the Gus Malzahn buyout, Arkansas would lead the SEC in buyout money. That's just – it's insane to really think about. Last thing before I throw it back over to Phil, I want to get your thoughts on Urban Meyer to the Jacksonville Jaguars. We've touched on it a little bit with the rumors that's been circulating. Obviously, now it is official, heading to the Jaguars. So how do you think Urban Meyer, his style – being one of the greatest college coaches to ever do it. How do you think that'll translate to the professional level for the Jaguars? I, he's not somebody who handles failure very well. And that's the thing that I kind of wonder about. From I mean, from the Jaguars' perspective, oh, I mean, it makes total sense. It's a home run hire. You go out and you make that move 10 times out of 10, and you roll the dice and hope that Urban learns actually how to lose. 
instead of you know having all these issues that he has had, and he is somebody that has obviously really struggled with that aspect of competition. So I, I think from the Jaguars' perspective, it, it is fascinating to see this because Urban took this job because of the control. He's got Trevor Lawrence, the number one overall pick. He's got $100 million in cap space to be able to build that roster into what he wants. And he's going to have a lot of power and a lot of control to where, you know, they could theoretically go like six and 10 or something like that in year one. And everybody will think that he's on the up and up. So I think that's kind of what appealed to him. I don't necessarily think that college coaches taking NFL jobs is going to become the norm. You know, remember Urban had two years off in between college and and NFL, NFL jobs here, but I think it's fascinating. I always thought Urban's next move was going to be something unique, and he wasn't going to go to a place like Texas or USC. I always thought the college game, I, I thought had kind of, you know, he'd kind of run its course in that. The NFL made a lot more sense for him. But don't get me wrong, living in the state of Florida, I am absolutely excited to see this next chapter in the Urban Meyer uh, legacy, so to speak. And it's going to be fascinating to watch what he can do in Jacksonville. Connor, you know what I think is really most amazing about it is that it's count- the hiring of, of Meyer who has never coached in the NFL and is 56 years old is totally counter to the, uh, you know, the, the recent spate of NFL head coach hirings of which you're usually you know, anywhere from 34 to 42 years of age. You're a hotshot coordinator, never been an NFL head coach before, but you've coached your way up. So this hire by the Jaguars goes in a totally different direction. It does. And it's definitely not of the Sean McVay school of thought where if you've one time, had a, had lunch with Sean McVay, you're getting an NFL head coaching job. Um, Urban Meyer, as far as I know, hasn't had lunch with Sean McVay. Maybe he has. I mean, I'm sure their, their paths have crossed or like Urban, you know, maybe recruited him to walk on or something like that at Florida back in the day. I, I don't know, but maybe, um, I could definitely see that. It's, it's an atypical hire for the NFL for what it is today, but I, I think Urban's got to be able to get his right offensive mind in there. I think we kind of take for granted that. He really kind of struggled as a play caller and had to had to bring in somebody like Ryan Day to be able to figure things out because he was struggling with that element. And late, you know, during his time in Florida, he struggled without Dan Mullen as well. So I, I think he needs to be able to have the right play caller in there. I know Scott Linehan was the guy who's been linked to that. I haven't seen if he's going to be, you know, given that role with the Jaguars after his, you know, one year at LSU. But uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see what Urban does from that standpoint because he probably isn't as good of an offensive mind as we really give him credit for. Kind of appreciate you as always, man. And congrats on the great tweet about what team could Tom Brady go to and not make the playoffs. Michigan, my friend, Michigan. And we could very well see two Michigan men quarterbacking against each other in the Super Bowl. Who knows? Oh, boy. Uh, that's that's the direction we could be heading. But, you know, Chad Henney, uh, if we got to watch Chad Henney, you know, at least, you know, I, maybe we get to watch Tom Brady, too, and it won't make us feel as bad. Have a great week, Connor. We'll Thanks, Connor. Week. Appreciate it, guys. Got to this Connor O'Gara. Give him a follow at CJ O'Gara on Twitter. And don't forget that Joe's Grilling Cantina has great specials available tonight. Great specials heading tonight. They got the Mexican Cali with two sides. An ultimate margarita starting at five bucks. I may need to head over to Joe's Grilling Cantina. Lots of good deals happening at Joe's Grill today, but you had to get over there and check them out. They're at 3400 South 74th Street in Fort Smith across from Harps. You can give them a call at 479-478-9600. That is Joe's Grill and Cantina. Wrapping up our number one coming up next.